The title of my lecture is Henry Moore and the Challenge of Architecture. Again and again in Moore's interviews and written statements, he repeated that he did not like working with architects, that it symbolized for him the subservient relationship between architecture and sculpture, and that architects only thought of sculpture as an afterthought, as mere surface decoration. Yet paradoxically, Moore continued to collaborate with architects throughout his career. From the late 1920s, some 50 years before Richard Serra would create sculpture that deliberately subverted its architectural setting, Moore was already addressing the perceived imbalance between sculpture and architecture. As his own work was increasingly finding homes in an urban environment, this became ever more prescient. This paper examines both completed and abandoned projects to assess how Moore challenged his approach to architecture throughout his career. And here we see an image of Henry Moore with I.M. Pei outside the um, Dallas City Hall on the inauguration of his sculpture, Three Piece Vertebrae. In June 1975, J. Carter Brown, director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., returned from a visit to Moore's home in Perry Green and undoubtedly with some frustration wrote an internal memo in which he stated that upon offering Moore a commission to create a sculpture conceived with the identity of I.M. Pei's new wing in mind, Moore replied, I have never done that. At the heart of the issue was that unlike so many contemporary sculptors, Moore's work was essentially not site specific. He did not allow the demands of a particular site to encroach upon his creativity. Left to his own devices in his maquette studio at Perry Green, he could engage freely with the found objects that surrounded him on the shelves, led only by his inspiration from the figure and organic forms, and not feel curtailed by a myriad of architectural considerations. In this instance, a solution was found when I.M. Pei came to Perry Green and together they selected Knife Edge Two Piece as a suitable idea, only with the forms vastly enlarged and reversed, hence the title Mirror Knife Edge, the model of which you can find in the exhibition. In theory, visitors could enter the East Wing by walking through the sculpture, making the tough abstract forms architectural in function. Yet despite being a unique cast, clearly this sculpture could work equally well in another site it did not need the National Gallery. Surprisingly, considering the number of works by Moore found in public places, and today the Foundation's website lists 38 countries, it was very rare for the artist to accept a commission. These, remarkably, were very few and early in his career. And I'll just run through those briefly. Okay, first is the West Wind Relief of 1928, which I'll discuss in more detail. Then the Northampton Madonna and Child from 1943. And before that, this is the uh, knife edge two piece that Moore and I and Pei looked at together at Perry Green. And here is the Northampton Madonna and Child, the maquette of which is in this exhibition. And here you can see it uh, in situ in um, Northampton. Moore's preference for prospective clients to come to his studio and discuss possibilities from already completed works was paramount. Even the controversial nuclear energy was arrived at in this way. And here we see the sculpture of nuclear energy at the University of Chicago. Its domed cap derives from a series of helmets and studies of an elephant skull, rather than an attempt to replicate a mushroom cloud. And here's the elephant skull from Moore's studio. Yet Moore, as a member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, which began in London in 1958, no doubt appreciated the skull and cloud associations which questioned the humanitarian implications of nuclear science when he selected the maquette for enlargement for the University of Chicago. And it, it was at the University of Chicago um, where they wanted to commemorate the scientific advancement of the um, uh, Enrico Fermi's first controlled nuclear chain reaction on their campus in December 1942. And like Mirror Knife Edge, the sculpture could work equally well somewhere else um, as it does with the six-foot-high working model. And we can see casts of it in um, New York, Baltimore, London, Helsinki, and Hiroshima. And here it is outside the Diedrichsen Museum of Art in Helsinki, designed by Vilja Ravel. 
Moore once stated, the best architects of my own generation began to think seriously about sculpture in relation to buildings in the late 1930s. And when they came round to it, some were persuaded not to have sculpture on a building, but outside it, in a spatial relation to it. And the beauty of this idea of a spatial relationship is that the sculpture must have its own strong, separate identity. Moore's earliest thoughts about architecture are recorded in his sketchbooks while a student in Leeds. In this 1920 drawing of a Byzantine capital, Moore underlines his observation that the pattern appears incised rather than applied, anticipating his own developing interest in carving. Other architectural studies reveal Moore's interest in breaking the figure away from the parameters of its architectural cavity, while still working within the established framework for reliefs. Relatively unknown works from this formative stage in Moore's career include this drawing for reliefs of 1921 that display a freedom of line and movement more akin to Matisse, while the architectural border serves to contain rather than restrain the composition. Still bound by their stone blocks, figures in Moore's six garden reliefs of 1926 allude to Assyrian and Egyptian reliefs with their timeless stasis, yet are distinctly modern. The ideas for these are developed in the same notebook as the studies for Moore's first public commission, the West Wind Relief of 1928. Shortly before his first solo exhibition at the Warren Gallery in London, Moore was approached by architect Charles Holden to carve one of the figures for the new London transport headquarters. Although Moore had been recommended by Jacob Epstein, who also made carvings for the building, Moore was reticent and needed persuading. He explained, even when I was a student, I was totally preoccupied by sculpture and its full spatial richness. And if I spent a lot of my time in the British Museum in those days, it was because so much of the primitive sculpture there was distinguished by complete cylindrical realization. Moore began by filling a notebook with ideas for reclining figures and inscribed one drawing, make architectural experiments. These prolific studies formed the backbone to a lifelong exhausting, exhaustive study on the theme and include sketches for the seminal reclining figure in Brown Horton stone carved the following year. The positioning of many of these block-like stone figures with head turned over the shoulder and knees raised is not only the result of the assignment to depict a personification of the winds, but largely influenced by his interest in pre-Columbian carving, and in particular the chalk mule that had recently been discovered among the Mayan ru ruins in Chichen Itza in Mexico. But as hugely important as the West Wind Relief was to Moore's development of the reclining figure in his work, the project as a whole was not perceived at the time as a success. Moore was frustrated by the difficulty viewing the work seven stories high, and in an effort to make the work appear more three-dimensional, he climbed the scaffolding in high winds to apply charcoal to the navel, as it was impossible to rework the carving on an unsteady structure. And here you can see, this is a photograph of the building from ground level, how um, hard it is actually to read the sculpture so high up. The carvings were slated in the press, mostly directed at Epstein, who was forced by shareholders to shorten the penis of one of his figures. Eric Gill's letter to Moore echoed Moore's own frustrations. It's a terribly difficult business combining what I want with what they want and with what the building wants and the subject wants and the passerby wants. Bound to fail in one way or another can't be helped. Architectural sculpture is like that. Holden again turned to Moore to carve a series of eight relief figures for London University Senate House Library in 1938. But disenchanted with relief carving, Moore declined the commission, although he did consider it initially and made compositions of seated figures holding books to reflect the purpose of the building. Another sketch is, I, is inscribed, think hard of the architectural problem, keep it architectural and big, Imagine that one was doing it for oneself, or say, for Wells Coates building. Holden even went so far as to have the stones cut to more specifications and placed in position at Senate House, where they can still be found today, empty stone slabs awaiting Moore's designs. Wells Coates, a Canadian architect and engineer, joined forces with Paul Nash in 1933 
to form an alliance of artists and architects called MARS, the Modern Architectural Research Group, which eventually became Unit One. In, in a statement for Unit One in 1934, Moore listed three-dimensional realization as one of five qualities of fundamental importance, others being truth to material, observation of natural objects, vision and expression, vitality and power of expression. The Isacon building, designed by Coates in 1933, which you see here, with its lean modern design, became a meeting place for artists and intellectuals residing in Hampstead in London in the 1930s. Jack Pritchard, who commissioned the flats, helped many of the leading Bauhaus artists escape Nazi Germany, including Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and Laszlo moholy nagy Gropius later worked with Maxwell Fry on the Impington College project, leading to Moore's first family group maquettes in 1943, and on a Dartington Hall, for which Moore created his memorial figure in Horton Stone.